I'll call the meeting to order at 704. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Allred? Here. Mr. Andreessen? Mr. Fell? Mr. Hopkins? Here. Ms. McFarlane? Here. Rose? Here. Ms. Sims? Ms. Yu? Here. Okay, so it looks like. Uh, oh. Let the record show that Ms. Sims is here as well. Um, so it looks like we have a quorum. Are there any changes to the agenda? There are none. All right. Approval of the minutes. Uh, approval of the minutes from the October 17th regular meeting of the Plan Commission. Any comments on the minutes from our last meeting? Are we ready to make a motion? I move for adoption. We have a motion by Mr. Rose. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> second by Ms. Sims. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? Any changes? If not, we'll do a voice vote. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes. Uh, communications. Do we have any communications? Um, we do not. All right, so we have no uh, continued public hearings, no old business, no new public hearings, no new business, which brings us to audience participation. Um, is there anyone who wishes to address the Planning Commission for five minutes uninterrupted on a topic of your choice. If so, please come forward and sign in. Um, and I should say, yeah, we didn't talk about this, but I assume we'll have some opportunity for public participation yes. at the end of the study session. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, so if you want to talk about something that we're going to talk about during the study session, um, you can wait and do it then. But if you have something other, sorry, go, Ms. Hopkins. For our discussion, rather. Yeah, however we want to do it is fine. We've been, fine. I guess we've been waiting for people to get the background material of the study session and give them a chance to comment. But we have we have a couple people we can take comments at any point in the study session that we'd like, I imagine. But yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I did have a couple handouts. Oh. At the last plan commission meeting, I learned that Im the Imagine Urbana Comprehensive Plan lays out the case very clearly that in order to have financial viability, we're going to have to become more of a, let's say, bedroom community. Uh, literally a community that hopes we have enough beds to cover our bills because of the very m many tax exempt properties that while they're making this town a joy to live in, are not making any cash contributions to running our city. So if being a bedroom community in a residential haven is our best future, I want to say that we need to own that proudly. And we certainly can hope that with the beds is going to come other great things such as retail and even nightlife. Um, so what do bedroom communities do to attract residents? Well, number one is being a safe and welcoming community. Let's look at some right around here, Mohammed, Savoy, St. Joseph, and Tolono. 
Every one of these Champaign County communities have passed a 25 mile per hour speed limit for their entire community in the last few years. Um, and that was just a step to make sure that people passing through their community as well as those who live there respect the residents who live there and um, secondly, see what their retail, their downtowns have to offer by moving more at a human speed. But it's not just sleepy suburbs that have passed 25 mile per hour speed limits, it's other bedroom communities like Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston, Seattle, Knoxville, Tennessee. In fact, at least 22 states um, do have a, a default urban residential speed limit for their, for their entire communities. And it's not just the Eastern progressive communities, the uh, ones that are 25 or less are the lighter ones. The darker ones are 30. You can see here that Illinois is, is a darker one at 30 for the urban speed limit. Um, um, in the West, you're frequently traveling on highways at 80 miles an hour, legally. And then you hit this small town in the middle of nowhere and it's 25. You go through that t downtown and you see everything they have. And you see the people and you can wave to them. They, are, they aren't going to put up with people coming in at, you know, 45, 55 off, the, off their highways, even though they highly prize getting from community to community, which is, which is what uh, U.S. highway engineers have totally excelled at. I mean, our, our fatality rate on those highways has dropped incredibly since the 70s. And the fatalities now are in our communities. They're especially on arterials. They're where we're living, not out on the highway, which is just incredibly safe compared to what it was. So anyway, do you think that you have to be a small community to pull this off? No, I found a wonderful ordinance that the public Public Works engineering staff of one small city, much like Urbana, managed to find the time to research and pass. The Illinois city of Crystal Lake with a population of 40,662, a slightly smaller annual budget than Urbana's and 64% larger land area, reduced its residential speed limit to 25 miles an hour in October 2021. The recommendations which were made by the city engineering staff, not needing a BPAC to push for this, um, were based upon running the federal highways free, freely available software and review of other materials, many of which have been considerably strengthened under uh, Secretary Buttigieg's, um, the USDOT national safety strategy, which really calls for speed management as a primary. Um, safe systems approach. Their ordinance provides an excellent model that Urbana can follow. Okay, well, examine Urbana um, call, looks at the current conditions. And it has a quote in there, 94% of households live within a half mile walk from a store. But it adds, keep in mind that the distance to a destination is inexact. It doesn't mean a destination is accessible. Some roads in Urbana act as a barriers that many people cannot cross safely. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. If we look at one of the illustrations to this problem that is in Examine Urbana, we find East Main Street in all its glory. Somebody's walking in the street, there is no sidewalk. Um, no crosswalk for about a mile down the street, and the speed on this very narrow road is 35 miles an hour, which comes up to a blind curve and spur onto University Avenue. This, if you go straight, you hit a corner, which it then tells you drop to 15 miles an hour. From 35 to 15, boom. You're on Pfeiffer Road, and that is, again, 35 miles an hour, but because that exceeds the statutory speed limit, every single side street has to have a 30 mile an hour sign. It's the most ridiculous thing when you drive down that road to see every, so you can just take all those 30 mile an hour signs off there and put them over on East Main, and the problem will be solved. Uh, for now, I mean, I think we really, sh we do make a case that it should be lower than that, but at least it shouldn't exceed that. Um, 
There are no sidewalks. Tonya Barnett, a young grandmother, 50 years old, was killed on a January night in 2021 trying to cross from her bus stop. The nearest crosswalk was a five-minute walk away because she was not in a crosswalk. She was not expected to be visible. No fault was assigned. And the street is 35, so of course people are driving 40. They were not able to tell from the bus video what the speed of the car was, just that they were all doing the same. Do we need to wait for a sidewalk budget that will never come because that street is a patchwork of non-city property or are there actions that this walkable city should have already taken but can't find the staff time and training to undertake? I am so grateful to the authors of Imagine Urbana for raising this very point by this illustration. And please note that the current public work staff is not responsible for this East Main Street situation, though they're gonna have to find the time to clean it up. Another one is Vine Street at Water, where Joseph Wilski, a retired news photographer living in a downtown Urbana apartment, was killed after shopping at Schnucks. The study was focused on making sure no state standards were violated. Um, we're not working towards making a truly walkable city. This is a man who's living in downtown apartments, just like we say we want and he got killed crossing the street, which by ordinance is 35, although in fact it's thankfully not signed at 35 out there. But the, the, but the ordinance, which uh, there is more discussion on that, has it at 35 for really no good reason. Um, these are not inevitable deaths, neither was Shelley Taylor's death at Vine and Maine, Christopher Bowen's death on University in um, 2022. If Urbana wants to be walkable, let's start with the most obvious and simple progressive steps we can take. And that's to make sure you don't have to be in an armored vehicle surviving in this dystopia that's been successfully sold by our car, petroleum, and insurance industries as normal. People belong in these streets and cars belong on these streets but they need to be at a speed that all humans, humans with all their quirks and flaws can handle and enjoy. So let's try it. Let's stand out as from the crowd in our micro urban community. What do we have to lose but our traffic casualties? Thank you. Thanks for your comments. came to speak during the study session about incremental development, but um, since that was such an impassioned speech, I had to res respond. Um, yep, that is like the biggest failure of the city of Urbana. Um, the failure, the um, failure to protect public space, um, which to me is what extreme speed is. It's a, an abuse of the thing that to me is the most important part <clears throat> of society um, to go 25 miles an hour over the speed limit in a, in a residential neighborhood is a breach of that trust um, <clears throat> and I'm a designer so I know we do that through design not through enforcement um, anyways another thing that I thought of as we were talking about this um, getting across major roads and this is um, feedback I shared at our ward specific meeting on the comprehensive plan I think Andrea was there. Um, the thing that's odd to me about these comprehensive plan maps <clears throat> of the past, I don't know what the one um, will look like here, is that they tend to divide things along roads, districts. And I live on one such uh, line that I have neighbors across the street, but they're in another ward, I'm in another ward, they go to another school, this uh, elementary school, I go to another, and everything, and then if you go to the future land use, th things start to fall across those same lines. Um, so I'm very, uh, the idea of neighborhood plans, I'm very skeptical of, or I will have to be convinced about, because as I see it, that's a neighborhood and that's a neighborhood, and then we have these moats between neighborhoods and how you get between neighborhoods is everything I thought we were trying to, f a lot of what we have been trying to undo 
uh, as the design profession, planning profession, um, <clears throat> because things were put in certain places for certain reasons, we know. But anyways, um, just getting across the street should not be so hard, but it should also not be another universe. Um, so I hate to see plans that assign along a road, um, that's a district and that's a district, because then, well, that's a highway. Um, rather than a public space, um, you know, especially when they're residential. Lou is looking skeptical, but um, there are places for that. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I, yeah. Anyways, that's all I have to share. I live on one such um, a residential collector that has extraordinarily high speed and is one neighborhood that has a road through it. So let's work on connecting neighborhoods. Um, I think neighborhoods in Urbana are fairly <coughs> coherent and a lot of the feedback is that we love our neighborhood. Um, so sure, maybe we need to address needs of a neighborhood, but how we lace the neighborhoods together feels very important. And so I endorse um, the sentiment of the previous speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, can we ask a question? Sure. Okay. Mr. Heber, there's a question for you. So, actually, I agree with you. I'm trying to figure out the details. Yeah. So, so where do you live, if I may Washington ask? Street. Okay. <clears throat> Between, Between Vine and Philo. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, your, your claim that our maps use uh, streets as dividing lines between future areas I, I the, the don't pre think it's that simple. I don't. No, see of course, way. everything's not as simple as you know yeah, okay. making and and statements to the to the public. Um, no, it's not specifically to that street. Um, but there, if you look at the commentary of the future land use map in the previous comprehensive plan, um, to the south of Washington Street, I believe it says preserve suburban character, and then to the north of Washington Street, it says something preserve historic uh, or sort of, you know, it's like, anyways, it's, it's, okay. th there are different designations in which, but the reality is like, regardless of the, the pattern of development or the, the period of time in which things were developed, that's not sort of the, the, um, the way neighbors sort of, um, get along with each other and socialize. So if neighborhood is, boundaries are very fuzzy. Yeah. I argued about this neighborhood yeah. plan idea before. I, I agree with you. I I just I wanted to yeah. get a little more specifically what you were talking about. Yeah. So corridors and how we connect across corridors, I guess is my um, desire. Thanks. Great. Thanks for your comment. All right. With that, I will assume that, uh, or I'll declare that audience audience participation is closed, um, at least for now. Well, again, we'll have an opportunity for the audience to participate during the study session as well, if there are additional comments. Um, that brings us to staff report. Uh, do we have a staff report? Uh, just a, a brief note. Um, the text amendment case that you all had forwarded on to the Committee of the Whole that was supposed to have gone uh, this uh, just past Monday, um, that meeting was, was canceled. That was going to be the only item on the agenda. So they're having a special meeting on Tuesday, the 12th, um, to where that will be uh, discussed at the Committee of the Whole. It's on the 12th because the 11th is a holiday. So this uh, upcoming Tuesday is when the committee will hear that. Okay, great. Um, there was also some discussion before the meeting, if, wondering if there was any updates on the Hope Village project. Do you know what's the latest on that one? So the latest is I, I actually went down to our, our building safety um, official earlier and did not catch him in his office, but I, I was going to ask him the same question because we got a letter about that um, just yesterday. Uh, as far as I know, they have applied for some building permits and they're going to be 
they're either they've either already started um, building out the community center because um, they had they had built out sort of the shell of it, but now they're getting to the interior of it. I don't know if those permits have been approved for them to do that work yet, but it is in progress or in the pipeline. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, okay, great. So that brings us to our study session where we're going to be talking about incremental development, walkability, and future land use descriptions. And I'm assuming we'll start with a staff presentation or something? Yeah, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'll, I'll run through. I've got some text and, and images and things, but we can... You know, you can stop me for discussion at any time, but I do have sort of some breaks built in here for yeah. for for discussion. Um, so uh, here's the agenda for tonight. So we'll do a brief recap of the uh, September 19th study session and um, and then the last study session we did, which was on October 17th, um, and then get into those uh, discussion topics, incremental development, infill. Um, and briefly on annexations, um, then talk about walkability, future land use uh, categories, um, and then give some updates and sort of talk about next steps where we're at. Um, so just to recap, back on September 19th, we talked about um, housing needs. So we had Braden Belcher, our uh, grants management division um, supervisor. Uh, he presented at that meeting. Um, I wanted to, let's see, I do have a recap. Um, a, a bit of, so what we heard at that meeting, I think the, the big takeaways from that meeting were um, that we needed to add some more principles and criteria to the plan to help us guide our decisions that would help us support the types of investments uh, we want to make to allow more housing, um, to add more of what we already know about housing to the plan. So I think uh, Braden had mentioned things during his presentation that weren't already, that weren't actually in the plan that would be helpful to add. Um, and then to uh, sort of tap into and aggregate housing data that is likely out there. Um, so the way we're, what we've been doing since then, so we are adding uh, more to the plan um, and more uh, sort of policy direction and such. Uh, also, uh, Braden ha is reaching out to or has reached out to local housing providers that we work with to see what additional data might be available. Um, and we've been um, sort of developing, kind of along with what I just said a minute ago, sort of developing principles that would help guide our decision making going forward. Um, I did go through, because I was kind of curious, I, I did go through Examine Urbana again to see if there was anything in there that might, you know, any housing data in there that might sort of help guide us, but I didn't really find anything that, that I thought would really get us to where we want to be in terms of having the data that, you know, that can help us make decisions. Um, so if it's not an Examine Urbana, we might not have it, or, or we might, whoever we talk to, to put that data together. Um, you know, might not have it, um, but we're still, like I said, Braden's reaching out to see what, what kind of data is out there. Um, so I know it's a long time to remember back to that study session, but if there is anything that I didn't cover right there that were sort of uh, big things that we need to address, I'd, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, and then the recap of the uh, 1017 study session, which was about um, Urbana's role as the economic driver. Uh, I apologize, I don't have my notes because I accidentally deleted them out of my slide earlier, and that's why we should save save uh, multiple copies of the same the same thing. So um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the what the main takeaways of that are. Um, we can. Uh, talk about those next time. I do remember one big takeaway is that downtown is not the economic driver of the city. It's potentially an economic driver of the city. So we heard that loud and clear. Um, and I believe we've, we're retooling. Um, we are retooling this big move. And actually, one thing, and I'll get to this later, but one thing we've been doing is, is um, doing a lot of editing to the, to the plan and sort of uh, I'd say tightening up these big moves um, based on feedback we've been receiving. Um, 
So if anybody has any comments now sort of on those previous study sessions, we can talk about those now before we move on and get into the. Sure, you want to pause for a second. Does anyone have anything to add on what uh, Mr. Garcia has summarized so far? Mr. Hopkins. So this is an instance of, for a general principle that we need to talk about. Um, it would be efficient and valuable to share incremental changes. Um, at this point, everything is a draft. So if you've got new edits, mm -hmm. it seems to me posting them somehow, I mean, working out the details is one thing, but let's not do what we did a year ago and close down communication for 10 months and then pop the completion. Uh, so it sounds like stuff's being revised, responses are happening. Uh, yeah. Back along the way will be much more efficient. This is something I was going to say at the end um, when you talked about next steps, but since uh, Ms. Tropkins has brought it up, uh, I think it's been effective to have, to go through these in a way that's kind of chunked the content mm -hmm. um, so that we're not dealing with everything at once. Um, and I think it would be good to do that with the next round rather than, you know, us suddenly have you know, a new draft of the entire plan appear in our, our, our boxes, our mailboxes, um, to again lay out a kind of schedule that we're gonna go through, you know, these sections um, with the edits. And if you have some of these complete, you know, getting those to us sooner than later so that we can keep the process going um, rather than waiting until you have everything, yeah. you know, done to your satisfaction and then giving it to us and then that, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a good point. Um, some of them, uh, you know, we've done some restructuring, you know, close enough, we've done some restructuring based on the comments as well. Um, so things might be in a different place than they were before. Um, so we, we still want to make sure you capture that, you know, that uh, if we just give you a section, you're going to maybe not... Uh, understand how it's now fitting in with the, the changes that we've made. Um, we, we can still do that. I just want to caution that, yeah, we've made some structural changes based on your comments, and so things may, may not be in the same place that they were before. Yeah, it would, it would be good even to get, like, an outline of the overall organization mm -hmm. of the plan. I mean, okay. that's something that I think that we would like to see okay, and, that's great. and comment on as well. So that would... I think give us the kind of roadmap to understand the, the other changes that you're making. To you. um, currently, um, Kevin and I are going through what the students had recently done on, um, you know, outlining kind of the policy principle thing, and uh, so that's what we've really spent a lot of time on is now how how do we structure that, and um, we're probably halfway through all of that information now. We been well we've been meeting twice a day actually um, just going through it together um, so it's a um, a big chunk of that is is part of those um, implementing that and making sure that um, it ties back in with the previous pages and just the structure but I think it outlines a good idea and we'll definitely do that okay great and as we get these chunk, chunks that you talk about, yeah, we'll try to do that and just make sure if, we, if there's any context we need to give you in advance of that, we can do it that way. Okay. Anything else during this pause? All right. There will be more pauses. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, tonight, uh, mostly covering what we're covering tonight is going to be really touching on Big Move 6 and Big Move 7 and then moving on to those uh, future land use categories. Um, so, uh, we had not really defined some of these terms, so incremental development, um, infill, um, walkability, so we're, tonight we're, we're putting out our, uh, our definitions for those uh, for discussion um, and sort of to, so that we can all be on the same page for, for what it is we're talking about. Um, so, we're defining incremental development as an approach to building cities and towns uh, by making small scale, many small-scale investments spread over a broad area over a long period of time versus making 
uh, sort of a few large scale uh, transformative investments over the short term. Um, so, you know, really, uh, and it's it's also incremental developments all, also about sort of the context. So, you know, something that makes sense to sort of uh, uh, do this type of development in an older neighborhood is going to look different than um, than downtown. Um, and uh, so that's a nuance to understand. So we're not, you know, we're not saying it's going to be the same type of development over over the entire city. And incremental development is really something. Uh, it's trying to. It's kind of harkening back to the way things had always developed up until the past, let's say, seventy years or so. Um, so it's taking small, you know, taking it, taking it one lot at a time, often. You know, and and building something on an existing lot, not just building an entire neighborhood out of whole cloth at once. Um, if anybody is familiar with the Strong Towns movement, their you know their approach is very much focused on incremental development. Uh, there's a lot of resources that they have to sort of explain this concept uh, in depth as well. Um, and then to kind of... Can we take maybe those one at a time? Are there yeah, yeah, we we can. Um, although I feel like infill development maybe should also be discussed as well. But we can, yeah, we can go go back and discuss this first. Yeah, let's, let's I think, take it incrementally. Um, is anyone... Yeah. I have something to say about this, but I, I don't know if anyone else has anything coming to mind about the incremental development definition or discussion so far. No. Um, so I'm assuming the, the point of defining this is that there will be a more um, sort of fleshed out definition of incremental development that will be in the plan, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I think another an important piece of this is that I'm not sure this captures is that I think of incremental development and I think the way that the literature describes incremental development is also about sort of change over time in how structures are used. So, um, you know, a single family home becomes a duplex or um, the basement, um, the basement in a single family home becomes an apartment. Like th there's those kind of incremental changes that are very much about incremental development as much as redevelopment of a single parcel as opposed to redevelopment of an entire block or something like that. Um, so I would think we would want to capture that if, if that's our intention. Um, because I think people who look at this and say, oh, they're interested in incremental development, um, that they're going to assume something like that is, is kind of what they're, they're interested in as well. Okay. Well, I'll try and figure out a way to work that in. So, so um, I, I took the many small-scale investments to include anything, conversions, uh, lot by lot, small subdivision. Um, in any case, the, the important thing to me is before there was one line of incremental infill, whatever, and my response in July was, these are different things. And right. so this is progress from my point of view. I'm not disagreeing with wanting to make sure it includes this. I'm just saying it sort of works. Um, the, the other thing to remember is that one of the ways to make incremental development work is to have frames for the big investments in order to know how to do the incremental development. So for example, knowing where we have sewer capacity or knowing where the break point is that we need to add an interceptor still matters even if we think of the development that's going to occur for that as happening lot by lot or street by street or whatever. So, so where this gets fit into other parts of the plan, we have to make sure we don't undermine the notion of creating 
long-term frames for what in the long run include big changes. Uh, sewers being the most obvious, mm -hmm. but drainage, detention basins, street layouts. I think mo activity. yeah mobility too um, yeah. to our you know the the comment that we the comment that we heard earlier um, if we're talking about places changing incrementally over time um, thinking through how the the street networks that provide access to those places might need to change over time and so um, I think this relates to a need to build out the future land use descriptions maybe a little bit more, which we'll talk about later, but yeah. build those out more so that they are not just talking about use, but they're also talking about, um, you know, what what does the, the public right-of-way in these different future land uses look like um, to accommodate the kind of change that we're anticipating, incremental or not, but certainly if we're prioritizing incremental, then... Rose? Uh, if we compare incremental development to transformative big uh, project development, uh, it seems to me that if there's to be a transformative one, the, the document would provide guidance on what we want to do, kind of where we're going there, what, what's the intent. But it strikes me that incremental development would benefit from the same provision of direction to it, uh, rather than I, I, I'm not entirely comfortable thinking incremental means haphazard and whatever happens. So I was thinking of the same thing that we and I would want to offer to talk about those differences equitable and strategic because as you said a community that has had systematic underinvestment might require something different than a community that has had lots of change over time or newer subdivision you know what i mean so if i think we think equitable we're going to give to the degree that that community needs, which might be a little bit more sometimes, and strategic, because it's aligned with our overall values, those two words seem to be important. Yeah, a lot of people, when they talk about incremental development, they also make a distinction between who is doing the development, and so is it um, pe people from within the community or is it people coming from outside the community and so mm -hmm. I think part of this um, back to Mr. Rose's comments is you know again making sure that our future land use descriptions address um, not just land use but they get into things like the character of development so that we're sending the signal about what kind of development incremental or or transformative that we want to see happen in these different um, areas but that we also, if we're serious about prioritizing incremental development, that we think about um, you know, the, the policies on the economic development side to support local actors and provide resources and remove barriers you know, where they exist um, to allow this kind of small-scale development to be done by local actors, um, you know, whether it's um, I don't know, providing education or, or you know, providing um, access to, to financing, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, and, I, I, and that was kind of, that was part of the intent of when we were discussing this as staff way back, way back when. Um, and we used to have something in here that kind of got to, to some of that. It was something along the lines of, um, you know, uh, making it easier for people to invest in their community, um, you know, is something that was pretty explicit. Like, you know, if you live here and you want to uh, help sort of build the community's wealth on on a whole by sort of taking part in the development game, you'd be you'd be able to do that. Um, 
I'm not sure that that's captured in, in our little moves currently, but we can look at that. Yeah, I think it says simplify the promoting process for residents to invest in their properties. I think that's part of it, so we're moving yeah. barriers, but I yeah. think, you know, th like I know we have um, policies to provide tax rebates for certain types of, of development or maybe in certain parts of the, the city. So thinking through how that aligns with this idea of incremental development, particularly from an equity perspective, um, to make sure that we're matching those things up and not just thinking about how do we attract development in general, but how do we attract specific types of development and in specific places that we've identified. Right. And I, I mean, yeah, part of the, not to go too tangential or anything, but, um, you know, part of the, the reality is that for the, the big transformative type uh, developments that happen is that, you know, most local folks don't have the capital to do that. So it's almost certainly going to be coming from outside the community. And while that might help our tax base, and we're, we're okay with that, we need more tax base, um, it's also, you know, that's money that a lot of that, whatever rental income is leaving the community, so it's not staying here and really, you know, churning and, and helping build the community's wealth as a whole, so... Any other comments on incremental development so far? All right. Okay, so on to infill development. They get, and um, so, okay, so let's just start with the, with the basic definition. Um, um, so we're just saying is development that occurs where infrastructure is already in place. Um, and then I took a direct quote, I believe it's goal 34 from our existing comprehensive plan that says, encourage development in areas where adequate infrastructure already exists. So this isn't a new concept. Um, it's something that's already on the books. Um, but we just want to make sure that we've got a common, sort of a common definition for it. And I like basic definitions if they work. And I think this is a basic definition that does work, but we can discuss. Yeah, I and I, I agree with this notion of definitions. Some of the, the definitions may be a definitions appendix like we have in the zoning ordinance. Well, we do have that in, in this. Yeah. But, and I believe I've added these already as placeholders too. And then okay. the, other, the other thing on the online version is that we have hovers over words. And so if somebody's reading through it, um, they can hover on a road yeah, and it'll, right. it'll take them to the definition. As well, so that's great, but I think Both we still ways. need an append. We still need an appendix because some there. of us aren't yeah. modern enough to figure that our definitions pop up. But the the other thing I think to say is that the 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 definition and the statement of encouraged development in areas where adequate infrastructure already exists is a more specific definition than infill development often connotes. So I think we, we also need to be clear in the plan, as you say we've been for a long time, um, that we're not taking a narrow view of what infill development means, which some people would say it means filling in that vacant lot on uh, Montclair that's been vacant for 75 years and is the only one left in the university down subdivision. Um, so that kind of infill, that's what some people think of as infill development. And I interpret this to mean that's not what we're talking about. We're talking specifically about encouraging development in areas where adequate infrastructure already exists, which is, in my mind, a great concept. But but your example would still qualify under this definition. Right. It's but it but that's not the only yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um and I, I do want to kind of make a distinction between infill. So infill and incremental 
development are are different things, but they're often going to be the same. You know, they're often a thing can be incremental development and also infill development. That's probably going to happen uh, a lot, but they but they aren't always tied together. I just want to make it distinct. Yeah, I think that's why this got brought up as something to define um, was because they're linked. So in big move number seven, the first little move is identify and resolve barriers to incremental and infill development. So suddenly you have the appearance of infill development when everything before that's talking about incremental development. So oh, right. infill, I mean, it, I think it might be maybe useful to provide some examples of incremental development, right. of which infill could be an example of incremental development. But you could have incremental, I mean, someone that you know gets a, a plat approved for a subdivision and builds one house this year and one house next year and so on and so on, right? That's incremental development. Um, yeah. But <laughs> it's not necessarily infill development, right. right? If you have to build a lift station to provide sewer to that new subdivision. So I think there is there is some nuance and we don't want to just say that, oh, you know, infill is often incremental, like let's, let's be, uh, be specific about what we mean when we're talking about these things. Um, right. And I think there's, if we're talking about promoting incremental development, there's probably other examples of there's examples of incremental development that might not be infill development per se, like the vacant lot kind of infill development. So again, it could be you know uh, a single family home becoming a duplex or um, you know redeveloping a garage to be an ADU or something like right. that. Right. And I, and and it's going like yeah, and that that goes back to the point I made where it's gonna it's probably going to look different in different neighborhoods. And I know certain neighborhoods, I know um, one of our um, historic preservation commissioners was concerned that, you know, talking about infill development, incremental development, like in, in a neighborhood like West Urbana, um, people might get the wrong idea um, that we're talking about just, you know, removing lots of old historic single family homes and replacing them with something else. Um, but we had a, a really good discussion at the Preservation Commission when we had our, our uh, session with them. And uh, um, so I, I think we'll probably, in the future, we'll probably be working towards a more, some more nuanced um, historic preservation, uh, I'd say tactics, to, uh, that would probably dovetail with, with what we're talking about here. So, you know, say you have an old historic home, um, but it's uh, not, uh, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say there. But you have a, an old historic home, it might make sense to say um, allow a garage with an apartment to be built on that same lot so that that lot is more sort of financially viable for somebody in the future. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of things that I'm envisioning. And it's, it's going to be neighborhood specific. I don't know that we'll be able to get into those, all those details for every neighborhood in this plan, but we can say, here's what it might look like in, say, an older neighborhood versus a newer neighborhood versus downtown. So yes, I, I think examples, we, we do need to have examples of that. Um, and so speaking of some just examples, if you're thinking about some of this stuff, um, so 200 South Vine, just north of us, I think that would qualify as um, I'd say that's incremental and also infill. Um, you're kind of going from, say, a bit lower density neighborhood over here, but it's got some apartments and things in it, and then you're kind of scaling, scaling up. So another part of incremental development is sort of the appropriate scale, too, which I don't think is in the definition. We might need to work on that. But um, the gather at University and Lincoln uh, definitely infill, not incremental, I, I would say, because it was kind of replacing, um, you know, it's it's kind of big. It's, it's sort of out of scale compared to what existed before. It wasn't going from a, you know, a three-story apartment to a five-story apartment, which would be more incremental. Um, 
those are just some examples to think about. So, um, I, I think we, we need to separate the conversation about definitions from communicating concepts and intentions in the plan. So I would argue that it makes no difference whether you and I agree on whether 200 vine or gather is incremental or infill. What matters is whether we can communicate in the plan what we want and whether we want 200 vine or we want gather for what reasons. So when the plan commission eight years from now has a case, they understand what the intent for that place was. And, and the, the student teams are, are working on these questions. Um, and I, I think you are too, but um, let's, let's remember to get beyond focusing on these, you know, sort of one line statements in the current draft and think about how are we going to communicate these concepts? Because you've, you've demonstrated the, the task. Um, we have to illustrate the range of possibilities of the things we want. And infill has connotations, incremental has connotations. We may need to use some labels as headings, but the content of the paragraphs that follow and the images that follow is what matters. Okay, so moving on to some images that follow. Um, the So uh, some of the students pulled some sort of examples, and I, I like this graphic because it kind of shows you sort of a continuum. On the top is sort of a, a continuum of residential types of development. The bottom is commercial type of development. Um, and this kind of shows the, uh, the least intense sort of type of development on the left going up to sort of more intense uh, things on the right. Um, but we were talking about incremental. The, I, I, um, I hadn't seen this graphic, but I don't understand what's incremental about this. Yeah, so, and I think it, it probably needs some explanation. I like it because it looks pretty nice. Um, but also, you know, yeah, that, yeah. So, else. so yeah, I mean, if we... If we had something like this that could kind of, or something similar that could kind of show you sort of the types, the development types that would fit in a certain neighborhood, um, I think that would be nice. But um, so this is kind of showing that, so the increment here would be, say, if you had, you know, if you had a duplex and you wanted to sort of uh, do something uh, incrementally more. Uh, I guess more intense, you would do something like a multiplex or maybe like a townhome. Um, you know, if you had a neighborhood that was just all cottages, it might not make sense to then throw in a bunch of townhomes because that's sort of a pretty far uh, or a, a much more intense thing. Um, so yeah, this might not be the greatest graphic, but it's well, kind of one of those continuums. I think it illustrates something particularly on the commercial side yeah so the commercial ones good. let's say that you have an area uh, or let's say that you have a couple of food trucks around town so someone sees that and they think oh um i should go build a huge mixed-use building right because it seems like there's you know potential businesses that would locate there um so you're totally short-circuiting all of these steps in between that would be a more incremental approach where um, you have, you know, food, a few food trucks, so you, you know, develop a, a lot where you have the food trucks that are located and you put in some furniture, right? 
um, that's successful. Maybe you build you know, something on a smaller scale, um, that's successful. Working your way up to a mixed use building to accommodate um, this retail activity that's grown over time as opposed to something that is much more speculative at the start. And I think that's a mm -hmm. piece of incremental development that people talk about. Is it something that is satisfying current needs and demands for a community, or is it something that is speculative, that is saying, we will go get all of this capital and make this huge investment, and let's hope that there are people to rent these apartments or people to um, fill this, this retail space. Um, so that's another aspect to it, which is both time but also space in terms of the scale and the type of development that's happening at different points in time. And I think the, the, the residential one doesn't work as well, but you could do something similar with, again, you know, a house that is occupied by a single family, right? And then you make an apartment out of the basement, right? And now you have two units, and then you convert the garage into something, and you have three units, right? Um, maybe a little bit more realistic than, you know, you have a cottage, and then you tear that down and build a duplex, and tear that down and build these <laughs> other things, right? That yeah. doesn't really happen like that. But. Yeah. So, so I, I think these two graphics convey something else, which is the top one is mixed residential. And that's an example of what I think we're trying to say we're okay with, not as something that's changing necessarily, or we'd be okay if all that got built at once. At least that's what I interpret the draft of the plan to say. If we could get somebody to transformally do a whole bunch of that somewhere, that'd be okay. Well, I mean, we do have areas where there's lots of land served by adequate infrastructure where there's nothing. No, I understand. So, so, so yeah. I mean, if, if somebody did this, if somebody did 40 lots and did some mix of this top thing, we would be good with that. Yeah, but that's not okay. incremental development. No, that's, that's not. That's, that's, that's speculative. Yeah, that's I mean, that's... Excuse. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. To me... When I saw this graphic, I assumed we were going to be talking about mixed-use development. Good look. Oh, yeah. that's a nice graphic, and it communicates a particular notion of mixed residential. It's I almost think, yeah, it's I almost think, exactly yeah. your description of mixed residential. Uh, it's even got live work in it. Um, that's why it doesn't work that great for residential. I, yeah. I think what what it's trying to convey is that in a residential neighborhood, you wouldn't want to go from having, you know, something that's mostly single family, detached single family homes to suddenly having these live work kind of spaces, right? Um, if you, that's your end point, right? You want it to be something that happens incrementally, gradually over a, a very long time period, particularly in a neighborhood that's built out. Um, so. Yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't work that great for for residential. But yeah, I don't think this is anything that was you're just saying that was going to be you know illustrative to include in the plan. But no, this yeah, we're not going to include this in the plan. It was here for discussion to yeah. generate discussion, and it's doing that. It I think hurt. I think all, what you would really want to see here, and I'm sure there's stuff online of people who have done this, is if you could just hit a play button, and it would go from all of these lots being sort of you know, undeveloped to slowly, like, a lot gets filled in here, something gets built there, time goes on, the house decays, it gets replaced by something a little bit, you know, more intense or whatever. We challenge students to do that on Monday. <laughs> yeah, or, or, a, or a neighborhood that's built out and there's um, a vacant lot, you know, and over time that comes to, to house a duplex, right? yeah. something like that. Yeah, so let's move on to these next things. So um, here's so here's another, here's an illustration, and this was from a, a Strong Towns article online, uh, and they were specifically talking about solving, uh, you know, maybe solving homelessness through making some pretty small um, housing, they're calling it micro-housing, because, you know, planner types like to invent new terms that you have to define. Um, 
But you know, in this example, it's kind of showing you've got some existing buildings in gray. This is kind of an ideal. This is all just, this isn't an actual neighborhood as far as I know. Um, it just looks like an illustration, but it, it's pretty good. So, and then this is sort of doing some infill. Maybe it's incremental, but um, it's, you know, adding uh, things that kind of fit within the neighborhood. You look off to the right, there's actually a six unit building that kind of fits in with the scale. Um, and, it, and it's just sort of kind of illustrating these concepts. Now, locally, we have some examples. Um, I like using this one. Um, this was designed by your fellow commissioner, uh, Andrew Fell, um, several years ago. I think it was 2018, maybe. Um, but this is one. So this replaced uh, an old house that was kind of run down. Um, the the four unit house, uh, or yeah, the building on the left used to be a house. It was incrementally developed <laughs> into a four unit. Uh, a four unit apartment building. Um, to the right, there's a duplex that's been there for a long time. Um, just on this one lot, they replaced one unit with, with uh, the seven unit apartment, which, you know, it fits in the scale and everything fits into the neighborhood. Um, just to look a little more context. So this is Green Street. Green Street's a really good area to illustrate a lot of these concepts because it's our mixed office residential district. And that district actually, as I mentioned during the text amendment case, it works pretty well um, to, you know, to achieve this sort of properly scaled, but also mix, mix of uses. So you see across the street, there's another apartment building with probably six units that's been around for, I don't know, 100 years or something like that. Um, and th but then there's also houses mixed in. There's also some uh, some commercial areas mixed in. Um, this is down on Washington Street. Um, this was so uh, just three single family homes. Um, the one on the left has been there for a long time. The one in the foreground on the right has been there for a long time, but it was rehabbed um, by Mr. Huber, who's in the audience tonight. Um, he uh, he then got a conditional use permit from the zoning board to put a second unit on the lot. Um, you might notice it if you're walking by. If you're driving by, you probably never see it. Um, so, you know, it's not affecting the character of the neighborhood, um, but it's making good use of infrastructure that's there. It's definitely making, uh, adding housing to the community, which we need more of. Um, and it's making, the I'd say, the long-term prospects for owning that lot better since there's two units on it instead of one. Um, here's just another, another view of that lot. You can kind of barely see uh, unit B. Uh, you see there's a, a sign uh, here on the address that says unit B is back there. So that's an indicator that there's two, two buildings on the lot. This one is uh, across the street and maybe a couple blocks away. Um, and this was a duplex that I believe replaced just a single family home. So that's um, very modest increase in, you know, in, in intensity, density. Um, so adding two units where once there was one, you see it's, it's just next to houses on, on either side. Um, okay, that kind of concludes my discussion or the discussion points. Uh, we can talk about it more if we want to talk more about incremental and infill development. I think we've had a pretty good conversation to this point. I think those local examples work much better to illustrate, you know, what we're yeah. thinking and what is likely to happen in our neighborhoods than the yeah rendering <laughs> conceptual yeah. 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 So, so, sort of thinking summary points, I, I think we should explicitly say that we're talking about spatially fine grained. My words may not be the perfect words, yeah. but one aspect is fine grained spatially, and the other is. Small changes over time. Yeah. Um, because that's what the examples you're talking about now are. And, and that's much more specific. The examples carry a particular story that isn't carried by the words infill and incremental. Well, and, and yeah, and I, I don't want to get too, too deep into it, but that's... Um, you know, we and we talk about Westerbana a lot, but that's a really good example of a neighborhood that was developed back before zoning rules. So it was developed incrementally. Um, so, you know, you had a mix of different housing types. You know, you might have a small apartment that went up here. 
these are all things that now are character defining elements of this neighborhood. That's one reason people love the neighborhood. Um, if it were built from the get go of just single family homes, people would probably love the neighborhood a lot less these days. Um, so it's kind of, but then, you know, then once development started being just big and massive and people tearing stuff down along Lincoln Avenue and putting up hideous apartment buildings, I can understand why people said, no, we should stop this. So I, I understand that history there. Um, I think the, the challenge and what we want to do going forward is, okay, rather than just trying to preserve neighborhoods exactly as they are, which isn't healthy for, for any neighborhood anywhere, um, is to how do you allow those gradual changes over time so that the neighborhood, so that all of our neighborhoods can be healthy over the long run, um, but allowing sort of small changes, uh, but not changes that are going to really destroy neighborhoods. And there's a strong towns concept where they say that no neighborhood should be immune to change, but no neighborhood should ever experience dramatic change. So it's, it's just allowing sort of, you know, an acceptable level of change over time. Okay. So, so jumping off the soapbox here. Well, and I think, you know, accomplishing that in the plan will be helped by, again, adding more to the future land use categories that get into character. So we're describing the character of places and not just relying on land use, right? So um, describing, you know, something that allows for both the single family home and the duplex that has the same bulk and massing as the single family home that creates the same kind of character of the place, um, I think will be important in terms of you know, sending that signal to people who might be interested in doing this kind of incremental and infill, often infill development. Okay. Just, not, not to point in a different direction, but we also got to protect you know, we just created the CMU. People my age lived in their single family houses in that neighborhood. Uh, so it's not that we never do transformative change. Uh, and there are times and places where we should do that. And the edge of the campus is the hot spot for that, and there's some others elsewhere in the community. So let, let's not exclude that possible. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, just maybe, maybe quickly. I, there's there's one little move where we we say that we want to develop a fiscally responsible annexation policy, um, and I think there was maybe a desire to get into that a little bit more. Um, sort of a, a basic rationale is that annexations are, are often not incremental or infill, which we've just said we want to promote. Um, and a lot of it is not going to be fiscally uh, sustainable over its life cycle. So um, a lot of cities that have annexed a lot of land as those areas get built out, the stuff that gets built there does not really pay for the long-term maintenance of the infrastructure that is gifted to the city by the developer after it's built. Um, so really the idea here is just to make sure that if we're annexing things, we're doing it in a smart way um, and not taking on essentially what's a, a long-term burden 30 or 40 years down the line from now um, when we do that. Um, and we need to develop a policy uh, because right now what we have is sort of ad hoc. Um, we, you know, we we don't really have a, a formalized process for analyzing annexations. It's sort of uh, I don't want to say back of the napkin, but it's there's there's not a good policy in place. So that's what this this little move is calling for: is to develop that policy and then so that we have guidance for annexations going forward. So, so my, I think, response in July to that line was 
since we're doing a camp plan, we at least ought to be able to say something about the nature of such a policy. And thinking about annexations over the last 50 years or so, um, they've often been for very different purposes. I mean, one was a political move to prevent the creation of a separate jurisdiction in Northeast Urbana, uh, which is plain some really funny annexations. Um, others have been to attract Walmart and another was related to how Frasca operates its airport. Um, so, so we, somehow we have to we have to say something more elaborate than just fiscally responsible about. I I, I think it's it's it just comes across as too simplistic. Um, we need a paragraph about annexation, in other words. Any ideas for what would be in that paragraph? Well, so some, think. some things, um, so there, there's a specific agreement about this with the sanitary district about annexation. And it's worth including the two sentences required in the comp plan so people know that because, you know, the plan commission in five years may have no memory of that at all. Um, and, and that has implications for strategy in terms of the sanitary district. Um, being aware of how the Urbana boundary is not congruent with the uh, school district boundary is relevant to decisions about annexations because in some cases where the city might benefit, the school district doesn't. This is a particular problem in the North Industrial District. Um, there are things we know. Um, and I think we should, you know, in indicate that it's not that we have no idea what's going on here, which is what I, take from the one-liner. But you would agree that it should be fiscally responsible? It, <laughs> Whatever policy this is, or? Well, it, it should uh, include fiscal implications, but that's not the only reason to annex. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when we did the crazy annexation to prevent the separate jurisdiction vote, uh, whether it was fiscally responsible was pretty much irrelevant. It was a way to figure out what's the most tricky, inobvious way along what zero-width lines to create an annexation that splits this area. Now, you, I mean, you can argue about whether the, politically it should have been done uh, or whether it was necessary to do, but fiscal responsibility was not much of it. And fiscal responsibility for the city is not the same as fiscal responsibility for the school district. Uh, if we choose to put industrial stuff where it supports the Champaign School District without adding students to their district, <coughs> we should be taking that into account. Maybe we should be putting land use that generates tax rates and not students somewhere else. So it's and maybe that means annexing some land that uh, initially might not make fiscal sense, and we might have to annex it because that kind of development needs sewers. Anyway. So is it appropriate to say fiscally responsible, but it's within the context of these other things that you've brought up? I mean, you have to well, consider that bigger whole. the question is, are you treating fiscally responsible as a constraint? And I'm arguing that it's an attribute. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are other attributes. It's an important attribute. It's certainly one that ought to be assessed and computed, if you like. 
but it's not the only attribute and sometimes it's not a constraint. And, and there's an equity issue here too. I mean, you know that we don't annex all the trailer parks that are adjacent to us because it's not fiscally responsible. But you could argue that it's in other ways irresponsible. And you know, and that, that's an, an issue that gets down to a whole lot of these other things of infill, incremental development, equity, yeah. fiscal responsibility, tax base, uh, housing affordability, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway. Short and long-term planning, because it might, as you were saying, it might not make sense now, but if I think about long-term, <laughs> creating good citizens involved in other development because people can, you know, turn into homes, right? You redesign it and you add a parking lot and, you know, people create all kinds of permanency that I think we Incrementally. Should, yeah, it, yeah, incrementally that makes a whole bunch of sense long-term for a community that we might be short-term, right? It might look like a limitation, but in the long term, there could be benefits if we think about yeah. that differently. Another way to look at it is if you want to change the metric on affordable housing within the city limits, it's a really quick way to do it. That's annex three huge trailer parks and enable a land use type and a zoning category that allows them to be incremental development in the way we've talked about everybody else. And it is true that in trailer parks, people go from single wides to double wides. They put in foundations. S uh, trailer parks can get sewered. Um, so uh, Urbana is about more than fiscal responsibility, at least the Urbana I live in. OK, so more work needed on that one. <laughs> Uh, yes, points that, taken. that was how I read this. It was uh, what's the, I read what you put as simply saying, uh, well, if we're going to do this, we could either put a whole lot of work into it with a whole lot of definition and, and direction, or this is instead, we're just going to say a simple thing like this. And yeah, I'm, I'm a little, I'm not satisfied with, with simply saying that, but to say more is a lot of work. Okay. Oh, we already had that. Pause, pause for the discussion about what we just discussed. Okay. All right. That's good. It's let's, going talk, well. let's talk walkability. Okay. So I, I've been working on ways to maybe restate this big move, but um, I, I did just want to kind of state the rationale behind this. I think several years ago I wrote on my whiteboard in my office, I said, I just posited a question and it said, what if we didn't allow development in Urbana that didn't make it more walkable? So essentially like we shouldn't be approving developments if it's not getting us uh, more to a state of higher walkability. I'm not stating this very well, but um, you know, the idea is not um, so it's, it's kind of a continuum, uh, and so we're not, with this big move, we're not suggesting that everything must be at the maximal state of walkability. Um, it's really, we're talking about incremental walkability is what, what it gets down to. So it's making, it's making things better than they currently are, so how can we do that? So that's, that's what we're trying to get at with this. Um, so it's, it's making things gradually better over time. Um, you might have a development that comes in and it's just really, you know, they've done a really bang up job and it, you know, it gets you, gets you to a really high level from the get go. And that's great. Um, 
But so if you want a baseball analogy, you know, we're not trying to hit grand slams on every pitch unless we're Freddie Freeman of the Dodgers, and then we probably are hitting grand slams on every pitch. But, you know, we're hitting singles, stealing bases, and taking walks. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so tonight, I do, like with our other things, I want to get sort of a common understanding of, of walkability. So defining it and then getting some direction, if you have any, for helping us improve it. Um, so I didn't bring my book with me. I brought it home so I could read it again. Um, but so Jeff Speck has a book called Walkable City, which we've referenced other places in this plan. Um, he opens up uh, that book, uh, and he he has this thing called a general theory of walkability, and it's it's pretty good. So I cribbed directly from that. Um, but basically, to define walkability is is describing how easy it is to walk in a place, and he identifies four things. So for an area to be walkable, walking must be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. And I will unpack those for you here. Um, so being useful uh, means that most aspects of daily life are located close at hand and organized in a way that walking serves them well. Um, so it doesn't say everybody must be able to walk to work and to the grocery store and to the doctor and to everything else they need. It's just saying, you know, most of the things you need in your daily life are, you know, they're close by and you can actually walk to them. So speaking uh, to what uh, Mr. Huber said uh, during his comments is, you know, just because something's close, if you have to cross, say, University Avenue to get to it, it's not terribly walkable, right? So walking needs to serve them well. Um, safe, I, I love this because it's pretty cheeky, um, but it's <laughs> safe means that the street has been designed to give pedestrians a fighting chance against being hit by automobiles. And, and furthermore, that they must not only be safe, but feel safe. So I'm sure uh, we've all probably been in a situation where we're walking on a sidewalk, and it's, it's probably actually pretty safe, but traffic's cruising by at like 50 miles per hour, and the sidewalk has, there's no parkway between the road and the sidewalk. Um, so yeah, that might be safe, but it needs to also feel safe as well. Um, comfortable means that Buildings and landscape shape urban streets into outdoor living rooms in contrast to wide open spaces, which usually fail to attract pedestrians. So um, I think a, a great example of this is when you're walking by a nice big parking lot uh, in the middle of winter and it feels like a wide open space and you're probably getting blasted with wind and it's not comfortable. It doesn't feel comfortable psychologically to walk through that space as well as physically. Um, and interesting, um, he says, it means that sidewalks are lined by unique buildings with friendly faces and that signs of humanity abound. Um, that's probably my least favorite of how he defines all these things, but um, I think it's, it's a good, good point. Um, just sort of as an example, I, this is from Street View. This is probably during the middle of summer because there's nobody walking here when usually there's tons of people walking here. Uh, so this is Springfield Avenue. Um, going uh, facing west, going through campus. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point out some things. So useful. So you've got um, buildings on the right, buildings on the left. You've got you know your classrooms and things. You've also, I think that building on the left has like cafe areas where students can kind of hang out and uh, you know do work and such. Um, so it's useful. It's got things close at hand for the people that are that need to, to be there. Um, it's safe, so this is good. I've highlighted a few things, but I think it's hilarious that this sign is knocked on its side, so it looks like the person's laying down, but it's a walk sign. Um, but so they've got the, the signs here. They've got these push buttons that, that make uh, flashing lights go. So this is, you know, this is one of the higher levels of sort of safety. Um, another thing they've done, which is really nice, is narrowed the street here. So it's, it's really narrow, so when you're driving, you don't want to drive fast through there anyway. Um, 
And then I, I highlighted some cars parked on the street, because usually there's cars parked all along here, which also sort of narrows the road for folks driving so that when they're driving through, it also feels tighter and like they need to be going slower. So this is one of my favorite streets to, this might be my favorite street to drive down in Urbana and, and Champaign, to drive down, absolutely. Yes, yeah, to drive down. Because you feel, I, I'm just saying, because when you drive down here, you feel like you're in a realm of like, hey, there's other people here too, and, and I need to slow down, and I need to watch out for people crossing the street here. Yeah, I love driving through here. And I, I rarely walk through there because it's not useful for me, because it doesn't have my daily needs there. Yeah. We, yeah, we can talk complete streets, too. Um, so comfortable. So you see it's got big trees. It's got buildings that sort of create this sense of an outdoor room. There's another building over here kind of kind of off screen. Yeah, and shade, which adds to, to comfort. Um, so yeah, it, it touches on uh, you know, a good amount of these things. Interesting. Ah, I mean, when there's people around, it's interesting. But what Speck was talking about was sort of the buildings. This building doesn't really have great ground floor windows that sort of give you that sense of of interesting. But again, it's a continuum. It's not everything is not going to be 100% walkable and meet all four of these things at all times. Uh, just one other example I found of something that you don't usually think of that is sort of a way to make things more walkable. I had never seen this before. This is at the Vineyard Church, and Andrea and I went there to have one of our one of our Imagine Urbana meetings with the public, and I was like, wow, they built a, a pretty nice pathway through their parking lot, and why don't more people do this? Did you notice the one ironic thing about it? Um... It does not connect to the street sidewalk. It only serves the parking lot. Oh, I did not notice that. Yeah, I, well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> However, Lou. Something else. Here yeah, about yeah. We did, walkability and for whom. We did use this as an example recently for um, a company in town that um, has a bit, very bit large parking lot. And we gave them this example to show that how they could get from the bus stop to their front door. So we didn't show the part where it doesn't connect in this photo, <laughs> but we gave them you know, that similar thing, like, hey, people, right. people need a way to walk safely through parking lots. And, and, and actually, the vineyard, I think, has it in a different way from the street. But it's another example of how complicated this actually is. But a great example, slightly different for, for me, is the area by Silver Creek. So you can go from, you know, like downtown, you can walk along the boneyard, you can, yeah, like yeah. you, I mean, it makes, and then you can move through most of downtown Urbana, pretty shaded, pretty nice, stop at a couple different places. It's a very pleasant, it's one of the, one I have friends or people in town, I love sort of you know, having the downtown Urbana walkable experience. And if you're really committed, you can all walk down to Crystal Lake and, you know, yeah. really it makes it feel like you're in a, you know, a very walkable city. <laughs> and plus that at Boneyard Creek or by Silver Creek, the artwork there is always changing. Yeah, it, yeah. and it's right. just, <laughs> well, but, but, you know, for people who like that it, yeah. and when you're down there, it's just very nice and they have the little table areas. Like this time of year, it's just, really really nice and so yeah we um actually speaking of those tables we just uh had our public works folks put new tables and chairs out this year as uh sort of a you know that's that's a low-hanging fruit thing but it it goes along with sort of recommendations from our public realm study which is you know just kind of put stuff out for people to use and people end up using it that's it's amazing um, um, may I, may I, is the Boneyard Creek included? Going to be included in Imagine Illinois as as a potential asset? You know why I'm asking. Um, like, is it going to be included in the plan as a? Uh, I don't know how we include that in here. But why are you asking? <laughs> For the people at home, I, I know. I just want to let you state it. I'm the. Uh, Commissioner of the, I'm the Boneyard. Oh. Chair. Okay. <laughs> well, 
sluggy. <laughs> I mean, there are a whole bunch of questions about this that include that, but I'm, it's not time to. Okay. And just sort of another example of sort of this incremental walkability. Um, just Andrea went out and took a, a photo of this along Philo Road. There's been a huge sidewalk gap that's been there forever. Um, and Public Works just went out. This is part of the. Uh, part of the pedestrian master plan, just filling in gaps in our sidewalk network. That's a really important thing. We, we have great public works folks who they take the bike plan, they take the pedestrian plan, and they work over time to, you know, to make those changes and fill in those gaps. So, Just one more thought, right, around this. This is a great example of putting multiple thoughts together, but sidewalk going to be wonderful there and especially if people want to maneuver around to the new um, urban wellness space mm -hmm. however if the speed limit isn't moderated i can't see families walking with kids it you know it's an area that it will it's a gr going to be a great asset but it's going to be underutilized because of just how the flow of traffic tends to maneuver in that space as somebody who's you know been over there. Yeah. So I guess I want to make sure we're thinking about these things very comprehensively because I want people to be able to take advantage of the Urbana Wellness Center and it's not unusual right for people to walk that far, but it's got to be in a safe walk if we want to think right. about who would be utilizing it. I agree. Okay. <laughs> Or the Preston Preston Williams School, right? Is that Dr. Williams? Yeah. Oh, this the new park district building. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So just east of Brookins. Okay. All right. Discuss. <laughs> All right. All right. Time for discussion, if we would like. So I love the examples that you put. However, when I think about walkability, I also think about like, uh, and I don't, I'm don't gonna put things, something parenthetical. How do we start rethinking conversations about neighborhoods that don't, that aren't restrictive, right? But I think about neighborhoods in communities that have been historically marginalized that tend to not be walkable. So I think about things like safety as in street lights, um, the inviting space, things being cleared out, not having <coughs> vacant lots that you don't want to walk by because of all the complexity. So I guess I want to make sure that we include images of the kinds of things that you were talking about. But I I think I've said throughout, I want to make sure that the neighborhoods that I might live in and exist in are also included in the vision, because if you don't include those things, if I don't hear them articulated explicitly, I think you're only talking about a certain kind of um, community. And so, yes, we want to make sure that there are all of the things, the trees, the sidewalks, the this, but also, when I talk to seniors in neighborhoods, they're concerned about the lighting, the roughage, the, you know, some other practical things that we want to be sure we're attending to. And, and increasingly, and this isn't a pleasant thought, but I'm encountering more and more young adults who will become adults in our community who have a variety of different um, physical abilities, maybe because they've been impacted by gun violence, and I also want to make sure in our walkability, we're also thinking about accessibility, too, and we don't have that explicitly articulated. Yeah, and I think that's, yeah, that's something that's always, there. yeah, well, because it's, it, it's tough. It's, you know, the... The part of me that wants to write pithy, um, you know, easily understood sentences, um, you know, it's hard to encapsulate all of that in one word. Um, so I, we we do add the the asterisk that says, you know, walking includes. I'm trying to look for it while I'm speaking, but yeah, it's just at the bottom of that paragraph. Big move six, the first paragraph. Okay. 
Yes. It says walking includes people in wheelchairs and with other mobility impairments. I don't know if that's the best way to state that, but. That, that's, that's an inherent contradiction, <laughs> which gets to my, um, so, so I, I have, I think, three concerns. I can't come up with a third one in my head right away about this big move. Um, and the, the inherent contradiction is part of it. Using the word walkability to convey a whole set of ideas is a mistake. Because those who don't know Jeff Speck's three books or whatever uh, think it means walking. Because that's what it, that's the word. I mean, it's not a word we made up that has some magic thing. It, it's the word walking. And we don't mean that. So we shouldn't say that. Now, to, to go a few steps further, we shouldn't say that walkability is the default. Because walking is not the default. You've got another statement in there that's much closer to what we should say, which I think we should say that all development, all whatever word you want to use, should account for, and, and you can either say walking, biking, driving, transit, freight, and freight includes emergency access. Okay, or, or you can say, you know, pedestrian, bicycling, automobiles. You can use whichever labels you want, but as your demonstration on Springfield said, this is not about walking. It's about being able to walk where there are cars and being able to drive where people also have to walk. It's about having transit stops, whereas was described from the, from the bicycle committee, the, on East Main, uh, part of the problem is where the transit stops are, what the transit routes are, where the sidewalks are, where the speeds are. So what we should be saying is more like complete streets. Mm -hmm. And we should be communicating that. It's, it's the example of the, the walking path in the parking lot that's not connected to the street sidewalk. Yeah, it's the example of getting the transit stops in the right place and getting them paved with a counter so that people can stand away from the street where there's no sidewalk at the transit stop. And my inclination of um, the, fo the focus of Jeff Speck is on streets like Springfield and streets like Lincoln with five-story apartments and, and the facing walls with retail on the first floor. If you want to put retail on the first floor, uh, you know, join all the other vacant retail on the first floor all over Champaign-Urbana. Uh, it doesn't work in this community. We've got way too much of it. It works in particular places. And Jeff Speck's stuff is, that's his image of this. And, and so the, the walkability label and what it refers to is completely inadequate as far as I'm concerned, number one. And two, we don't want to talk about walking. We want to talk about connection. If we're going to talk about connected neighborhoods, they're connected by walking, by biking, by driving, by transit, by freight access, because we have all this delivery stuff now. Um, and it's the combination of all those things that we've got to try to. So anyway, that, this, this <laughs> whole big move, as far as I'm concerned, has to be completely reframed. And it doesn't, it doesn't change the notion that you want to increase walking, but you also want to increase biking. You also want to increase the safety of the relationship between automobiles and these other things. So it's a communication problem as far as I'm concerned. Well, so the intent here is to really 
make a strong statement that this is the thing we're most concerned with, getting, getting people around by walking. And I think that's not what we should be doing. We should be concerned about the whole thing because it's the relationships among them that matter. Sure, but that is, is, can that not be encapsulated in talking about connectivity in, in the other big move? Talking about well, okay. connected neighborhoods. If, if you're going to have another big move about connectivity that talks about all this other stuff, but then you can't also say that walkability by default. <laughs> you can say walkability, improve walkability if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not married to this make walkability the default setting. You know, I came up with that six months ago or however many months ago, and, it, that, and I'm fine with changing that. It's the combination that. of those words. Yeah. The walkability statement I don't think is a good label for what you want that to be about. And default is problematic because we have to account for all these other things somewhere in the plan. And from what we're working on with land use types, it's pretty clear that if you want to actually give examples, as you did with Springfield, you really have to say, here's how it works for pedestrians, here's how it works for automobiles, here's how it works for transit, here's how it works for bicycles, here's how it works for freight, which includes emergency access, which often becomes one of the biggest issues in subdivision plat approvals is emergency access issues. Yeah, so I, I hear what you're saying. I, I know that there are so many examples throughout the country where, you know, where somebody adopts a plan that says, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to really focus on walking or whatever, or complete streets or all that. And when it gets... When stuff gets built on the ground, you might have something that qualifies as a complete street by, you know, whatever definitions they have. And then there's still traffic going 40 miles per hour and there's still people getting hit and killed. So I want to make sure that we're not, I, I want to set us up for success by being really explicit about what we're going for. Okay. But so one of the issues is walkability is about 25 mile an hour speed limits. That's about cars. And you've got a statement in there that all modes should be safe and convenient and comfortable, I think. And that's the statement we should have, because you can't yeah. have safe pedestrians without safe drivers. You can't have safe transit riders without safe traffic around, because the bus is you know, a vehicle. It drives. It hits people in bicycles. We've had both in this town. So we've got to think about all the, how all these things work together. I think what I'm hearing is that what you really want is you want to make the conditions for walking safe or the conditions for basically getting around on the sidewalks, whether it's walking or in a wheelchair or in a stroller or you know, whatever. Yeah. That you're, those conditions are safe. Um, I think it's... Yeah, it's just it's just problematic from the start the way that it's phrased. Make walkability <laughs> the default. All right. <laughs> I think it would yeah. be better to step back and just think about like what yeah. what is it that yeah. we want to achieve yeah. as a community? We want to create environments where walking is safe, right? It's not that we want to give the impression that we're anti-car. You know, the, I mean, the reality is that most, as you demonstrated yourself. Um, both in how you got to the the Vineyard Church and how you navigated or how you did your tour of Springfield. Um, well, that was that was from my computer. <laughs> okay, well, but yeah, most people are driving, right? Or at least they're driving yeah. part of the day to get to where they need to go. Um, so it just doesn't mesh with reality. I know people, yeah. you know, like this sort of catch catchy phrase of walkability. Oh, that sounds great, but. Can you go back to those four things that you went yeah. through? Just and, and if I could just interject, I think what Lou said ties back to what you just said, Dustin, about making it safe for uh, what we want to envision is that it's safe to walk in our community, but also it's safe to bike, it's safe to drive, right. it's safe to, you know, all of the things that Lou mentioned. 
Yeah, we call that multimodal, right? Yeah, so, right, right. So we're doing things in right. a way that provides for the space in the public right of way um, so that all of these different uses, right, all of these different modes um, can cohabitate. Uh, you know, when you look at these, the list here, useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting, um, well, you know, so much of this is about the the surrounding land uses, the mm -hmm. development, um, which is just not something that we have. And we've had this discussion, you know, about how much of Urbana is actually walkable by the definition of, of a Jeff Speck or people who talk about this term, right? You know, downtown is prob probably one of the few places or, you know, parts downtown of the- Downtown and campus. Yeah, right. and the university, right, are the places that we, we, we would consider to be walkable. So many of our residential neighborhoods don't have all of these other elements and are very unlikely and would face you know, significant resistance from the people who live in those neighborhoods to changes that would make those places more walkable by the definition of just spec. Um, now, does that mean that we can't do a better job of making you know, the conditions of walking in those places when people have the opportunity to do it better, right? Yeah, we can. I mean, we can put in sidewalks, we can put in street lights, right? We can address, uh, you know, issues of, of vacant lots and, and things like that. But I just think we, we've got to be careful about the, the message. I mean, so much of, of the value or the use of the comprehensive plan is about the, its signaling, right? The message that it sends to people who look at it. Um, I just don't know that the way that this is described right now is really doing the kind of thing that we're intending or what I'm hearing, you know, and mm -hmm. the way you're describing it, what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, well, so. Because you talk, one other thing, you talk a lot about, like, at the start, you were talking a lot about development. Like, we want to make sure that we don't have development that isn't walkable, right? Right. Um, but you know, again, like so few of these things related to walkability are addressed in any particular development, right? So much of this is about what happens in the public right of way. And it has to do with the things that we, right, are building as the city, um, much less than it has to do with what a single development is doing on their particular parcel, unless we're talking about like a major subdivision or um, yeah, I mean, and I, I, so I think I pointed this out maybe at one of the last meetings, um, but my prime example, and this is something I, I would never want to see happen again, is how Schnooks has been developed. And I was actually going to put in some slides about Schnooks and how horrible it is to walk to Schnooks from every direction except the southeast. And then it's not great. But, and that was a planned unit development. And we approved a planned unit development that has one sidewalk connection from one direction. And people walk to Schnooks from the west all the time, and there's just no good way. And you have to walk through parking lots. And it's, it's ridiculous. So as somebody who has to, you know, has to review plans if another Schnooks came along, I want to have the backing of something like the comprehensive plan that says, you know, a developer shows me those plans, I say, great, you're not, I don't see accommodation for people walking, you're not making walking more useful or safer or comfortable or interesting. Sure, I think that's important, but yeah. at the same time, Schnucks is only within a walkable distance for a very small portion of the population in Urbana. Um, a lot of people, a lot of more people probably bike to Schnucks than walk to Schnucks, and even more people drive to Schnucks. So it's again the balance of these things, right? So yeah. how do you accommodate and plan for and have you know um, regulations or or site plan review such that it's accessible by people who are walking up to it, which are going to be a you know a fairly small portion, right? Um, but also accessible to people who are biking to it um, and accessible by people who are driving to it, which right. doesn't uh, just deal with the site itself. It has to do with you know, 
the much broader network of, of mobility and connections between areas of the city. And I, I guess one reason that I, you know, thinking back, originally wrote this as make walkability the default setting is that, you know, since World War II, we have made driving the default setting. And that's, you know, and we're, and that's why we have most of Urbana that doesn't meet the definition of being walkable because we've just said, hey, we're just going to accommodate driving as, as the default. So, it's just kind of trying to flip that on its head and be like, it, it's not, you know, if there were another Schnooks that came along and it were super walkable and it had zero parking, I wouldn't be like stamping approval on that thing. You know, like it's, there, there's going to be parking. People are going to build parking for something like that. It's just making sure that they're actually accommodating people who aren't driving, right? Right. I mean, well, my point is that it's, it's as much a question of urban form as it is about yeah what happens on a particular site, right? You would have to have multiple schnooks, right, spread throughout the city, or have the development of the city be much more dense so that you have more people living within that half mile radius of the schnooks for it to be really walkable, for people be willing to be willing to walk to schnooks to do their grocery shopping. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about incremental change that we're prioritizing, right, yeah. that's not going to happen anytime soon or at a very quick, you know, rate. So, right. No, and I I will acknowledge that between yeah. these different modes of how people get around. I agree. I agree that that we have four uh, uh, criteria here, and I don't see it as one, two, three, and four. I really see safe needing to be Trump, needing to be prime, prime, primary in the, uh, among these four, and that's what gets sold and the rest uh, move on. But I have a question about, uh, this is, uh, I have a question. Uh, can Urbana set a, I see a lot of stoplights with a yellow rectangle surrounding them can is the city of Urbana able to declare those does it have the authority to set speed limits everywhere in the city um, I I don't know what the state law is I believe they made some changes a while back that would allow you to set a default speed limit citywide but for a long time, I think the lowest you could go was like 30 miles per hour citywide. Um, but I think they may have changed that. Audrey probably knows much better than I do. So if, if you want to ask her to come up. Um, but she cited several other communities around us that have already done it. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just point out, so I, I think that is a great idea but um, as Mr. Huber pointed out it's a matter of design as well so you know we're not going to say 20 miles per hour speed limit everywhere where it's not posted and magically people are going to drive 20 miles per hour because the streets are designed to drive 45 or 50 um, but it's a start and I think that you know that's something we can look into. I, I love the broader conceptualization of all of the various ways that um, people could take advantage of spaces, including walking, driving, transit. So I even think about maybe how do we think about the most inclusive language? I'm going to differ. I actually think all four of these are important. In the middle, on climate change, comfortability matters because nothing's going to be walkable if they're not trees and those kinds of things. So safe is good, but you know, not dying of 110 degrees, <laughs> um, you know, those things all, all matter. And if you were going to go to the Snooks example, as somebody who's lived way out, I've walked to Snooks when I haven't had a car. So don't, you'd be amazed about who, who, who walks, because um, I think a mile is pretty common in most cities. Uh, and but also, if you were thinking of transit, because also a number of people, MTD is also, a, it's a transit stop there, and it wasn't designed for transit either. So I think if you go to all of the domains, 
biking, cars, transit. It's a stop for many people. It's a stop right there on the corner, and it's just a very bad stop, particularly in the winter when you're navigating. It's a. I mean, so if you were going to think about taking a few of those locations and really taking your litmus test, I bet you you would think about all of those areas of need and the design issues that you'd be concerned about probably impact transit, walking, and biking pretty universally. And again, as someone who's taken the bus and wait, well, this is waited there in the middle of the snow, um, trust me, it's a, it's a journey. <laughs> um, in terms, if, uh, imagine Urbana is going to sort of be rolled out and sold over time. If walkability or this this notion that that you, we can we can do non-car transport from one place to another it seems to me one way of selling it would be to assign somebody to find walking paths through and on those walking paths identify beginnings of uh, elements that meet these criteria <laughs> And, and by that, I mean not, not a path through Crystal Lake, but how, uh, how you, what it's like to go from, you know, from uh, Wiley School to Crystal Lake. What do you encounter mm -hmm. in so that way? Deborah knows I do this because I, I intentionally have a period of time once a quarter where I have the lived experience of the people I serve and support. And so I will navigate going to the doctor, going to work and seeing what's possible and feasible. And so that way, if I'm advocating for something, I've lived it, so I'm not sort of making up a story and I've never kind of done it. So one of the reasons why I can tell you so much is I will park my car and, you know, figure it out. and. You know, and I can tell you, I'm going to get to work two hours late because from where I live, it requires a lot of complications. And I'm fortunate enough to have a job for that. But then it helps me be in spaces and places to tell you what it's like to kind of how to navigate. So I've, you know, I've parked my car and walked down to my massage therapist. And na I mean, I've been literally, I, one of my favorite trips is, you know, having to go to Carl at the fields because that's where my <laughs> doctor is, and you know, waiting at lot E14 for an hour in you know 20 degree weather because I'm proving my point. But I I do that, and I think I really recommend that people really try to take advantage of trying to be in the city, reflective of the values that you're trying to adhere to. So because I can't say, oh, we could put our car down if I'm not living it. Yeah. Early on in the process, um, we followed or walked with uh, an individual that lived in Edge of Mall with a motorized wheelchair and how that person went everywhere, how they went to church, how they went shopping, how they went to schnooks from Edge of Mall was a feat of mass, uh, mass proportions on how, how they could navigate going across parking lots, et cetera. So you're exactly right. Um, there are many challenges depending upon what mode of transportation you use. So. So, so for what the plan ought to do with this information, um, we have a pedestrian plan, correct? I could not yes. find it online today. Oh, yeah, it's, it's hard to find. Sorry, some of our plans are very hard to find. Yeah, well, this is not good. But in any case, That's <laughs> I couldn't find the pedestrian plan to get prepared for tonight. Um, and I couldn't find my copy of it because I'm old enough to probably have a paper copy of it. But um, in, in any case, somehow what we're talking about and the existence of a pedestrian plan that we already have and was adopted as an amendment to the comp plan is either going to be included in its current form in this comp plan or is going to be 
incorporated by reference and annotation, which I think mm -hmm. is a better idea because it's, what, eight years old? I don't know. It's not brand new. Um, it's 2020, so not, not quite eight years, years old. Okay. Yeah. And which means the one I have a paper copy of is not the most recent yeah. one. Well, and we're, I mean, we're, we're still uh, implementing the 2016 bike master plan, too. So, I mean, they're both still relevant. Right, right. And that's the one that's eight years old. That's yeah. the one oh, I yeah. did look at today. Um, but I, I think the comp plan, as, as I said, my suggestion is incorporate by annotated reference, meaning we're not going to go back and update those documents right now. But we have to include them because either they become not part of well, there's another complication here. Either they become not part of the comp plan, which may be okay, or they have to be incorporated by reference. And what I mean by annotation is paragraphs that explain what's been done and not done and what's changed and not changed and how it, that plan relates to the content of other aspects of this plan and of the bike plan, et cetera. Now, one of the reasons the, the what I'll refer to as the previous administration um, attitude about these plans was they should be adopted as amendments to the comp plan to give them more backing potentially for legal purposes. I'm not sure that's worth it because the advantage of keeping them independent is that we don't have to explicitly figure out how to update those plans when we create a new comp plan. Um, and, and as I said, the, the, another way to do it is to incorporate them by reference in the comp plan, if we really think that's necessary. But anyway, we need to work that out right. one way or the other. Yeah, and we we it's on our to do list to have staff meetings about how we're going to incorporate all of the other things that have been incorporated into our current plan into this new plan, right? Because that's okay. a necessary thing. And in and in the current draft uh, under background and trends, uh, we did say we, we're acknowledging existing plans, and we we have links to those plans and what they are. But I think. Um, we're talking about staff, we need to go a step further. And yeah. you know, which ones are really, you know, were adopted as part of the comp plan. And and whether we want to adopt them now and right. so forth. That, that, yeah. I, I realize that. Yeah. So I, I don't, I'm assuming we're getting sort of toward the end of this conversation. I don't know. But in, in reference to the pedestrian plan, the there are a couple of Places and and again I I couldn't find it today so I'm I may be out of date. Silver and Vodder is missing streetlights and sidewalks. It's been written up. I found a student master's project on it from 2015 that has all the details. The police chief has cited it as reported in the News Gazette. We're building sidewalks somewhere. And we're talking about walkability in downtown and campus and, you know, the good spots. What's the explanation for why nothing's happened there? I don't know. Um, I, I do know that we have done uh, some projects for our equity and quality of life projects to install street lights in uh, areas you know that have historically been disinvested in and I know somewhere in here we talk about um, focusing on our community development target areas which are, are something that we yeah. update over time I'm guessing that silver is prob probably or silver water is probably in a community development target area it, it so we might be, be able to do the problems with the target areas is that their census tract or census block group and sometimes the census block groups, because of the ecological spatial fallacy, um, don't actually include the little points where things actually have to be done. 
And, I'm, and my recollection looking on a map is that Silver and Water may be one of those places. Yeah, well, and we're actually we're in the process of updating those target areas based on the newer, newer data that's out there. In, in any case, something. This is another part of the make walkability the default statement that sort of gets me. It it it's focused on Jeff Speck's view of the world, and it that's a downtown, higher density, partially commercial view of the world. And many, the East Main Street, the East University, the Silver Vodder, the Learman, the East of Wiley School, the these walkability problems, meaning explicitly the missing sidewalks and street lights, don't seem to be the center of attention. It seems to me they should be. And there's, right, so let's pick Silver Vodder because that's a great one. It, it's because of the complexity, because if you get to three blocks over, because people put it as a monolith, three blocks over, it's, it's housing, it's sidewalks, it's graduate students, it's people who've been in the neighborhood for a long time. It's just the three blocks from, I forget what street, that Philo are Road. that are no not no. even it's Philo three blocks in that are all apartments but once you get past the apartments everything else in the neighborhood is lovely you just have like a a parcel that has no lights and no sidewalks but people put it under the same umbrella but it's not it like right, that's what I'm it's only <laughs> three blocks like and I it that's gets what, missed yeah so okay. it gets mixed but I I. I hate that people talk about it as a monolith because it, it isn't. It's a very lovely area. I have staff over the, you know, it's just beautiful, but people but, but have one conceptualization that's just not accurate. But the it, three blocks that you're talking about, you're right, are underserved and underrepresented, and, you know, it's because it's all rental. And, okay, I mean, this goes back to fiscal <laughs> responsibly annexation and fiscally responsible development and if we want to actually care for a mix of everybody welcome in Urbana I think we've got to frame our stuff differently anyway that, that's sorry <laughs> from my point of view may have more to say Okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at the clock. We're already past nine o'clock. Just making that statement. We're on a roll. Uh, was there a comment you wanted? Can you come up to the mic so that the audience at home can hear what you have to say? There, there is a uh, EQL project for adding sidewalks and streetlights to silver between Fletcher and Philo. So that is the Silver Vodder neighborhood. And I think that that's actually being done right now. I think the it's, it, yeah. How about the lights? They're also doing lights. Oh yeah, I think the lights were delayed by the manufacturer. Um, the other thing I wanted to suggest is that I understand the, the objection to saying walking is the default, um, as if we're almost not considering these other modes, but I do want to argue that walking is fundamental to being a human animal and that it would be okay to say walking is fundamental and will be a fundament of any project that we were doing because every single person eventually is a pedestrian or on an accessibility vehicle. 20% um, of Urbana does not have access to a vehicle. And uh, yeah, across, Schnooks is the closest affordable grocery to the entire north side. So I don't think these things can at all be dismissed as trivial. I mean, these are, these are huge items. And to deny that we're fundamentally walking animals is to buy right in to the, where the corporations want us to be. And we're gonna see that in the next four years. So I, I think this is our opportunity to say, we have human values in this town. You know, and for humanity, 
who are animals, in fact, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but not, for corp not for falling down to a corporate culture that's told us you, don't, you are not real, you don't exist unless you're driving. I think that that's about all I have to say. I was going to mention just a couple little side things. The house, the, the, um, house on Washington that you showed was a wonderful example. There was a uh, bicycle shop was started in the garage next to it, uh, in that house next to the house. I believe, is it 907? Your house? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that, uh, that bike shop became Paul's Bike Shop and then went on to Eugene, Oregon and became three Paul's Bike Shops. <laughs> and, and it started right there in that uh, mixed use area. And um, I don't know if this is anywhere in there, but again, having some variability in West Urbana, like we mentioned, my house has a five foot yard front yard that I absolutely love. And I'm like, why can't everyone have a five foot yard? Because when you walk by, you can hear everyone gossiping about you, you know, in the, in the summer. I mean, it just makes for such a more human culture. I mean, where instead of back there behind this, this mowed lawn, or even if we allow habitat and it becomes a, a massive meadow, I don't, you know, whatever, it's still, far, far away, and I think there's people who want to be closer. So I think that variability is exactly what makes Wuna so charming, as, as has been mentioned. I have for the moment. Thank you. Oh, and I did want to say one more thing. Sitting here has just given me so much faith in Urbana now that I really honestly had just begun to lose in dealing with only engineering topics. So thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Did you want to? Oh. In a comment period. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just to follow up, uh, David Huber, I'm a resident of Urbana. I think that's you. Well, no, can you sign in? I don't think you signed in before. That mic's not working. Oh, that mic's not working. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were so trying to get him to sign in. Okay. okay. My name's David Huber. I'm a resident of Urbana. Um, uh, just to clarify from my first comments, the 2005 Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use describes, has a note north of Washington between Philo and um, Vine, residential urban pattern, and then south of Washington, closer to Cottage Grove and Philo says suburban, residential suburban pattern. Now, what's the difference? It's the same zoning with the same um, development regulations. So it, 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 to me, that's raising a bigger point of saying it's that thing, but it's the development regulations are the same. So I think a lot of this is I mean, it's, when it's R3, the setbacks are the same. So to me, an urban uh, pattern is something about closer setbacks, block faces that are uh, fewer driveways and so on, but our um, zoning ordinance doesn't perform that work um, is, I guess, a, what I want to say. Uh, another thing to point out is that in... Um, I guess I would like to see maybe revisiting some of the um, examiner banner that occurred two years ago because I, this always stuck with me and I was able to find it. <clears throat> in a, there's a section on racial segregation. Okay, understanding the history of segregation in Urbana is important in understanding how and why the city looks the way it does and can help our community devise relevant local solutions to address those issues. In the mid 20th century, in contrast to mostly white neighborhoods south of University Avenue. So we're talking about a street. And we keep doing this, saying this is doing something up there below this street, and this is. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, that, that is the dividing line. Uh, so in contrast to the mo mostly white neighborhoods south of University Avenue, banks would not lend, realtors would not sell, and landlords would not rent to African-American households. 
African American households were forced to live in the north side. At the time, unincorporated Urbana and substandard homes without Bangi, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it goes on. So I just thought that's, I remembered that and it stuck with me. So here we were using um, roads. And what's right. wrong with that? Um, what's, <laughs> I mean, what's, that's a statement of history. No, no, there's nothing wrong with the statement of history, but I think there's still to the point of, of these roads that divide and using that road to make it harder to get between those two sides. That's my, uh, that's my critique. So, so you're talking it's easier about to keep it as the effect of, I mean, m much of that was simply the shorthand for a location that people knew of where the divide was because it wasn't actually right at the at university because the hospital was north of university and some other stuff was north of university. Both hospitals were. Um, and they were not considered part of the North End. So I, I, if, I, I think that reference is simply geographic shorthand. Now, there, there may be another distinction, which may be what you're trying to get at, that it's harder to cross University Avenue. Uh, but, but I don't but think- But that keeps people in their respective places is the point. Okay. And, and that's what you're trying to say. Yes, this, and if we do not promote bridging that river, okay, we are keeping people in geography that is convenient to some people. Right. Okay. To keep other people from walking, <laughs> from mixing, essentially, um, I, I would just say that 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 would be a great goal to aspire to. Um, having moved here and gone th via uh, a partner who was had a job at the university, what happens when you move here and you live out of state is you talk to the assistant so-and-so in the department that you, know, you have a postdoc in, they live in Savoy or they live in Muhammad and they say, you know, we're like, we're moving here, where do we, they're like, okay, well, East of Vine. Okay, then you know, uh, east of Phila, <laughs> east, of, and it's always this layer. Um, and we should just promote things that um, help bridge <laughs> those uh, distinctions of class, really, I guess. So what, 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 are, what are the bridges? Um, well, a very easy one is like, you know, Philo in Washington has a lot of commercially zoned land, uh, and that's a certain node that, to the point of do we need neighborhood plans or something else, you know, maybe we need it all, but that is where three neighborhoods come together. Um, you know, Philo and Florida, that's where a few neighborhoods come together, and something about those, <clears throat> the development of that land can so, negotiate so, these okay, divided so, so, neighborhoods. So th this suggests another thing about the land use types at what I think of as fractal scales, that w we should be thinking about explicit nodes, and Washington and Philo is one of the sort of obvious ones, I think. Uh, and and, and I think the note is actually from Washington and Philo to Learman in Washington. Uh, and you can even turn it into a corridor because that corridor becomes really interesting with the new wellness center, Brooklyn's up for grabs, the DART site vacant, I mean, not vacant yet officially, but available, let's say, and available land still not developed where the family dollar is. And, and your point about it's not a node internal to a neighborhood which, where we're using neighborhood loosely, neighborhoods are fuzzy. That one neighborhood that, owns and it's it, theirs. Right. And they it, get to push it It's not a node owned by one out. neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so it's a node we ought to specifically identify, and we've just, I mean, this is the kind of collaboration I like, we've just come up with a whole set of reasons for that node that have to do with equity, transportation, because it's a place where you've got transit, uh, you've got traffic, you've got a lot of auto traffic, uh, the walkings, you know, all of the things. And there's opportunity in available land. So in contrast to the notion in the earlier imagined banner of we'll later do neighborhood plans, which I opposed because the first thing it says is draw lines around neighborhoods. And I said, no, no, no. Um, that um, we should think in the comp, and what, the other reason I said we shouldn't do neighborhood plans is because the issues are connections among neighborhoods, not neighborhoods themselves. Um, and um, this is probably not the only opportunity, but it's an opportunity that the comp plan is a special opportunity to highlight, to put out there. And we don't have to zone it in the comp plan. That's not what a comp plan is about. We can state the intent and these reasons why it's a good intent at that particular place. And then when we get around to zoning, we'll have this statement of intent. That's why we need to annotate it about why we think these kinds of things should happen here. So if I can make a comment on incremental development, which I guess is what I do, um, and I, I will acknowledge it's probably a little bit of jargon in the way that at some point in the past infill was maybe jargony and then came to, you know, because it's jargon, but on the other hand, there's a, uh, there's an industry around it. There's organizations. I attend webinars with groups of people that do similar things. Um, uh, I think like, for me, the most obvious, like, <laughs> sort of counter, uh, you know, why why incremental development and not <laughs> is, you know, we don't want another Lincoln Square um, aggregation of a lot into a single ownership that then is holding a significant amount of our central business district with under the hands of a single um control uh and it once was a lot of different lots that could have changed um and i think it keeps coming up we you know the city tells like we would like bling in the square to be something and it's like and then jim webster says well, it's private property you know so it's just this untenable thing anyways uh but it is about a i think like a developer ecosystem is kind of my understanding as well of like incremental development that you need sort of these different actors to perform different work, and a lot of that relates to finance and what access to capital they have and the kind of capital that can go to certain projects and on another project and so on. I think like we are in a, a weird, I think it is hard to get the smaller uh, development ecosystem here but for other reasons, uh, but um, I guess the question is sort of like, it was the verb promote because um, yeah for me it's kind of like how and I'm not quite sure how um, how you promote it um, uh, I think like to the point of the ecosystems thing I think there's a big difference between big and small developers like my understanding of larger developers is like they make money off of money um, managing capital asset management fees um, and so on that someone like me just does not. Um, you know, the Opportunity Zone thing in Campus Town was about deferring capital gains and making money by eliminating capital gains. So it is a series of financial abstractions that are 
it's it's another it's another thing. So there's something immediate about smaller scale development, I guess, to the point of is it speculative? Well, it it, it can't because it just has to. It's just more less abstract. Um, therefore, has to be kind of responsive and probably responsible because. It's just occurring. Uh, there's a different risk profile or something uh, for the developer. Um, probably, like it's possibly like not possibly counter cyclical, but it probably fills in some of the gaps and cycles of what one kind of development can do. You know, they they say, "Oh no, we're not. Capital's too expensive." Um, well, I'm continuing to build stuff, but I build such a, at such a slow rate that I can just keep going rather than churn everything off. Um, <clears throat> I guess to the point of how, um, and this is too far into the future, but because it's zoning related, but um, is like we don't really have zoning incentives. I think in the MOR there is something about um, like you don't have to go through a certain review if you save, if you have an existing building that you convert, you are sort of incentivized to save that. Um, in any case, because it's often the discussion, we need more affordable, you know, and it's like how do we get there? We don't have the means to subsidize it. Um, so what are the other tools we have to subsidize it? Um, I know in cities like Portland and you know these kinds of places doing fancy zoning uh, reform, you know there's lot split incentives if you keep the existing house that it, I don't know it's far but but I don't like the hollowness of saying promote, and I'm not, I just don't want it, I want there to eventually be meat behind it. So I'm just thinking out loud, how, how could we actually promote it? Um, because more than just like, yes, great idea. Um, <clears throat> I also think that it possibly, sh yeah. Uh, I just now have a random, maybe as far as the increment, I guess some kind of, tension in there is like, um, you know, if there is an empty lot in a neighborhood that's built up, there's only one, should it actually get the same type of housing that that three blocks has primarily? Um, or should we insert a, a quadplex into that, you know, knowing that it is a, it's, the last empty lot for a little while. Um, uh, I guess that's just a question of continuity versus diversity or something like that. Um, from my point of view, the way I look at everything and why I brought the duplex question, and many people talk about this, is <clears throat> when you do have vacancy and you are, that is the opportunity to create a mix and to force the continuity in when there is generally stability. Um, now, the boogeyman is always that that's going to set off instability, and there goes the whole neighborhood, but we know that that's not actually occurring in this market. So uh, I guess, yeah, that tension of I don't like incremental when it seems sort of I get the politics of it being kind of soft and gentle and so on, but there's, how do we sort of, you know, push it a little bit as well, um, that it's not jumping in scale from this to this, but, you know, when we go that increment, how do we get here? Our zoning is not very good at um, detaching sort of what would you call it, units or occupancy from form, right? Like, shouldn't we allow the same bulk with unlimited number of units, um, possibly in certain, we don't, so we end up with weird proportioned houses because it can only be one or two units. Uh, we're not creating the kind of housing types, you know, studios, one bedrooms within, uh, 
it, it, these are just the, the thoughts as well of increment. Um, and I know that some cities will give further, you know, FAR or whatever regulates bulk or mass based more on units within a building rather than just simply the overall. You're the experts on this. It's just throwing a lot out there. Uh, walkability. Um, to me, the great irony of this city is like, we basically need to be more like campus um, because when I go to the places that are heralded as like these walkable places and so on, they're basically adopting a lot of the things that campus had and you use the photo from campus. Um, but I guess that's just a, an eternal tension here that if you live and work on campus, you want to get out of campus where everything stops all the time and there's crosswalk, you know, et cetera. But uh, it's not a bad model and it's very close. Uh, one other sort of thing is, I guess sort of like looking, taking more just the, rea like if we are promoting infill and not and resisting annexation, there are certain facts now about our city that are somewhat set. And one for me is like, we're not an alley city. We didn't develop with a lot of alleys compared to some cities. And we have a policy of, of eliminating alleys um, if if they're proposed. Um, that's all to say that you know there's a lot of things that are good um, design features for walkability, but at this point, like we have a lot of driveways and we're not having backloaded garages. Um, Meaning, like, that's what I sort of contend with on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm thinking about designing a building in Urbana and how it relates to the urban, the urbanism. Um, and I don't have an alley. I don't want to put a garage, you know, et cetera. But to me, there's a certain uh, denial of that in some of the literature that I've seen, like on Missing Middle and so on. You'll never see a garage. Um, in those little cartoons um, by the missing middle guy or Jeff Speck, but um, you know they're they're part of what we have to design around if you if you design and build in Urbana. So um, yeah, like the idea I guess of the streetcar subdivision with all these alleys and then you know full like we don't have that in most of of Urbana. Um, we have a lot of detached houses and garages. So anyways, uh, so I guess that's just a, a little bit of pushback on some of the romance of um, the incremental development people because if you look at the images of the kinds of houses they like, there's a certain pattern um, and it's not just aesthetic. There's certain fundamental things to our city that prohibit or make that a challenge. Um, to achieve that. So how do we get there within what we have? Um, that's it. Sorry to keep you. Thanks. That's great. Thanks for both of your comments. So back at 9 o'clock, <laughs> you broached the idea of moving on to... Uh, well, I wasn't bro categories, I wasn't but... broaching an idea. I was just stating that we were at nine o'clock. Yeah, just just throwing that out there. Well, now we're at nine forty. Right. Um, what are we? So, so the next topic is the land use categories. Future land use. Yeah. Future land use descriptions. I think it's worth at least getting started, but I'm. Not the only one here, maybe not for other people. Yeah. What's everyone's thoughts on this? Deb votes for a break of some sort, it sounded like. So, okay. Do we, we push it then? meeting in two weeks. Yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah, our next meeting is in, is it two weeks? I, I haven't looked at a calendar. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we could just devote a study session at that meeting to to this, to the future land use. Yeah, that would be the 21st. Or, or if you want to discuss. 
So in addition to the doing um, future land use at that meeting, we could come back, even as you started this session with an update on, you know, yeah. the revisions you're making, that would be an opportunity to get some of this other stuff out in front of the group, because the sooner we get to that, the, I mean, there's, there's presumably two, at most three more meetings before Christmas, before the end of the year. Yes. Uh, and we're going to need all of them, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I would say future land use, but also, I mean, there's just some other content that doesn't exist in the draft and that we'll need to think about where it fits, like the mobility maps, yeah. so which are related to the future land use, one would hope. Um, so what, you know, some of this other content we could spend some time looking at and discussing that as okay. well. Um, thinking like the, the development opportunity, um, development suitability maps that have been made, um, which relate to some of these other big ideas, thinking about where or something like that. So would you want the, would you want the next meeting then future land use maps, but maybe just all maps? Would sure. you, yeah, maybe yeah. it's a broader map discussion. Yeah, well the future land use is not just the map, which I think right. is something that we right. discuss, be part yeah, of that we discussion. We talked about the annotations yeah. and then character, yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, I think that's that would be good. And then also, um, you know, what Lou mentioned, just, yeah, just more of an update on where we're at. And if you could get us an provide, outline provide before an that outline. meeting, that would be yeah. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And presumably there's, there's text and such to go with all the things that are in the draft or simply listed as maps or documents or whatever. I mean, there's lots of pieces that uh, progress may be made on that we can talk about. I mean, as tonight, the idea is to deliberate about what, where we are and move forward, not the notion that something is finished and we're checking it. Understood. All right. Anything else? I want to thank both of our members of the, the public for hanging around and providing us with yeah. such great comments. Really appreciate that. Um, Bring your friends. I know. Yeah. <laughs> or even your, not your enemies, but even the people who may not agree with you. We need this kind of input. It's so important. Because yeah. you know things we don't know. Bring your friends and your enemies. Last parting words for tonight. Um, all right. I'm always surprised at people who message and say, I watched. I'm like, really? You <laughs> 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 need to work on your life. <laughs> all right. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> like, really? <laughs>